you. Um, well, for, first of all, I, I have to apologize that you're, you're stuck with me, actually. Um, we, we, we've known for a couple of years that there's this big challenge with negative marketing in our industry. Um, and John Getzinger talked about it the other night. Uh, he called it fear marketing. Um, and we tried to get some experts to come in here and speak about that, but um, the experts on that topic are generally marketing professors, and there's a global conference for marketing professors on the other side of Boston going on right now, so none of them could come here. <laughs> so unfortunately, you're stuck with me, but we do have some new data here to present. Um, we did a couple of omnibus surveys in the last month or so uh, that looked at how, con um, how users of omega-3s differ from non-users, but then also how the users of omega-3s go through the buying process to decide which products they use. And, and I thought it would be interesting and valuable um, to, to share. And, and uh, for those of you who are GoEd members, um, you can actually download all of the data from the members section of our website, the raw data to work with. And for those of you who are here at the exchange that are non-members, um, we're happy to, to share that information with you as well. So, so just um, email me and, and we'll send that to you. Um, real quick, before I get started, uh, just since we're here in historic Boston, this is actually a photo of a fishing vessel from this wharf taken uh, in the late 1800s. So there is a historical reference to where we're at here. Um, I'm hoping this is gonna work. It looks like my slides might be a little oversized here. Uh, okay, so I'll have to uh, adapt here. But, but part of the reason why we thought this was important to understand um, how consumers are going through this buying process is because we, you know, obviously we work with 150 members uh, um, in this industry, and one of the things we hear all the time is that this is an industry that has very low differentiation. And, and when you focus on these low differentiation marketing strategies, what often you do is you're, you're prioritizing customers. So, so um, your, your biggest customers, you, you work with them, you give them extra care, and everybody else, they get some sort of sales support. You rely heavily on third-party validations. There's all kinds of quality seals and logos and things like that out there that everybody uses. Um, but as, as if, if you look at it another way, um, there's all these other ways you can, you can uh, market to consumers. Consumer packaged goods companies uh, heavily focus on brand management and, and moving up the, the box here to try to get premiums for essentially the same product as you can buy for, that's a store brand or private label product. Um, and, and we think there's actually more ways to create value here. And yes, a lot of these are smaller niche volume opportunities. Um, you don't sell as much product, but you get much higher margins for the product. And if, if companies in the industry are really trying to differentiate and are concerned about um, the amount of money that they, they're spending or, or, uh, on advertising and the return they're getting, um, there are other ways to think about it. We don't all have to play the low differentiation, um, high volume game. So, so in our survey, um, we, we did a couple of things. One is we, we didn't want to focus solely on supplements, um, and so... Um, one of the things we did is uh, tried to classify users of omega-3s as anybody who's actively trying to increase their omega-3 intakes. So that can be through dietary supplements, that can be through um, functional foods, or that could also be people who are just trying to eat more oily fish in their diet. And what we found is that's about 53% of the population. And then on the non-user side, there, there are, uh, you know, 23% uh, of those consumers are actually using no products, um, not trying to um, get any um, significant health product, um, not just omega-3s. Um, and then there are some that are actually using multivitamins, um, but, but haven't made the leap to go to the omega-3 stage yet. So we obviously gathered all these demographics and everything, um, and, and you know, we, like I said, you, you can access the data. There's all these different ways to look at it. We, we looked at um, psychographics and ways they behave differently, um, and so you can cut the data any way you want, and, and this is really just a high cursory um, look at all of this data in order to try to spur some, uh, some new thoughts, and, and you can you know, dive into it and come up with your own conclusions. But one of the things we found is that there's definitely an age component to how omega-3 consumers um, uh, look at it. And this is a, these are a couple of slides on the difference between users and non-users, and some of you have seen this before. Um, but, but one of the things we found is that you know, if you, these are non-users of omega-3. So 51% of uh, millennials are not trying to increase their omega-3 intakes. 51% of Generation X consumers are not trying to increase their omega-3 intakes. And then as you age, which I don't think is any surprise to anybody in this room, 
um, you, you, the usage starts to increase, and, and obviously then by inversely, non-usage decreases. Um, but, but what's interesting is the size of the population buckets are very different here. So you can see um, the millennials actually go under 18 years of age, but when you're gathering consumer data, it's hard to get um, un under 18 data. Um, but, but you can see the size of these uh, population buckets are much larger than the core of this industry, the people who are really um, using this. So there's a big opportunity to, to reach out to this big non-user group. And one of the things we've heard is that, um, a couple of times, is that this is a, an industry that's focused on people who are, have moderate to um, high incomes. Uh, and one of the things we found, actually, for omega-3s, though, is that uh, usage is not necessarily a determinant, or income is not necessarily a predictor of usage, unless you're in the very lowest bucket. So this is the only point, if, you're make, if your household income is less than $25,000 per year, that's the only predictor that you're going to be actually trying to consume, or not trying to consume more omega-3s in your diet. And so um, if you think about it from, from, from uh, that point of view, it's kind of surprising, however, that non-users will say that price is the biggest reason why they're, they're um, or is the biggest factor in choosing a health product. And this isn't just omega-3s, this is all health products. So, so if income isn't a factor, um, what, why, you have to ask yourself, why are non-users so um, price conscious? And, and for whatever reason, there's this major divide. It's not necessarily an economic issue, um, but, but, but price is a major factor. And if, and if you look at who the users are of omega-3s, what's more important to them, statistically compared to non-users, is um, perceptions around safety, perceptions around quality, and then, of course, um, doctor recommendations. But again, this is only looking at the difference between users and non-users. Um, and I think there, there, there's a better way to look at it um, when you get just looking at the, at the people who are our main consumers today. So, so if you're going to sum this up, um, the difference between users and non-users, really the, the, the difference is, I think, that they tend to be, the people who are buying omega-3s, and I don't think this is a major secret, they just tend to be active, healthier people in general. Um, and, and I think that's great, but when we hear all the, the presentations about how there's this great deficiency and there's all these um, significant health problems, the people we need to be targeting or people need to bring into our market are the non-users because they're the ones, according to these statistics, who are 4.6 times more likely to know no metric about their health. Um, whereas users of omega-3s, they, they obviously can try to estimate their omega-3 intakes better, but they know their cholesterol um, numbers better. They, they exercise more regularly, um, and of course, they're more likely to monitor their calorie or, or caloric intake. So the other, the other thing that I think is interesting is, is, is the age factor. And, and what, what I, the only reason I think this is interesting is because th there's a lot of ways that, that companies are marketing omega-3s uh, today. Um, the vast majority of the omega-3 market is right here in this bucket, the older consumers, um, and you can see that, that, that what people are trying to do competitively is steal brand share from each other. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because competition is, is a great thing. <clears throat> but, but the only reason I, I say this is because as a trade association, we, we're trying to grow the whole market. And really, I think the opportunity for a, a massive public education campaign is here, is to bring these non-users who are younger into this bucket and, and, and there aren't a lot of successful marketing cases for how to do that yet. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how, how can we um, actively target those people. So, so I just wanted to show you a little bit of the user versus non-user data before I get into the buying process of how um, omega-3 consumers are actually uh, uh, choosing their products. But uh, let's look at that population group right now. And I think that the, the first interesting thing is that we, we hear in this industry a lot, a, lot, a lot of the time that there's competition between the different outlets of, um, of products. And what this chart shows, and it, I hope it's okay, it's, it's my first time I've ever shown this, so it's a little hard to read. Um, but, but supplement users, <clears throat> of, the, of the people who um, say they're taking omega-3 supplements, 9% of them are also trying to consume functional foods with omega-3s. And 15% of them are also trying to, to increase their oily fish intake and get more omega-3s through seafood. Um, 
the, the same, uh, the, you can see from the, the other way of looking at this is that of the people who are trying to increase their omega-3 functional food intake, only 7% are also trying to increase their oily fish intake. So these aren't big numbers, um, but, but if you, if you um, uh, look at it as a whole, 15% of those consumers are trying to actually um, do all three. And then if you add them all up, you see that about half the market is, is a market where you're trying to consume all these different sources of omega-3s. And I think that's actually important because there, there aren't a lot of complementary um, sales propositions. But, but if half of the, the consumers are trying to get one or more sources of omega-3s into their diet, there's a real opportunity there. Um, one of the things we looked at is we, we said, okay, let's start at the beginning of the buying process and say, how do consumers know that they need an omega-3 product? Um, and what we found is that actually there are these very small differences between the omega-3 user, which are these blue bars, and what the national average um, says. So, so what, the way to read this is 40% of omega-3 users say they're trying to manage heart health but somewhere around 33 to 34% of, national, of, of, the, of consumers in the, in the country say they're trying to manage heart health. Um, so it, it, and what's interesting about that is this very small difference here and this very small difference here uh, above the national average for brain health and this very small difference here for wellness above the national average is really the fundamental foundation of our whole business of this, what we heard was a $26 billion industry globally. It's all in, in those little differences there between what omega-3 users are doing today and what the national average is, the people who aren't using omega-3s. The rest of these areas here, there's no statistical difference or we're below the average. But there is an age component, and this is what Dave was getting to, is that if you look at the younger consumers, um, their life outlook and their lifestyle is completely different. So the blue bars here are the older consumers, and the, uh, the, the I guess it's yellow bar, is, uh, are the younger consumers, the millennials and the Generation X consumers. They look at things completely differently. So, so here you start to see the differences spread. They, they rise above the national averages. Um, for, for older consumers rise above the national averages in their concern about their overall wellness, their, their, their activity around managing their heart, their activity around managing their brain health. Whereas the younger consumers, on the other hand, they, they rise above the national average in terms of the amount of money they're in activity they're spending on caring for their family's well-being or slightly above the average for managing energy um, and, and also just, you can't see a difference there, but it's slightly above the average for managing stress. So it's a completely different lifestyle. It's a completely different outlook. Um, and I think that's why um, the next speaker, Sam, is going to tell you a lot about how you target these millennials and motivate them. And, and I think that's going to be um, really valuable because there aren't a lot of products in this industry that are focusing on the, the, the younger consumers and bringing those guys into the market. And yet, I'm not saying, you know, because, because younger consumers, because younger consumers um, are above the average for maintaining energy, I'm not saying make an energy beverage with omega-3s. But, 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 but if you think about the, the consumer and what they're going through, and if they're trying to maintain their energy um, because they're starting life and they're stressed out and they're working long hours to, to get their career going, um, you, you have a completely different way of approaching them and a completely different message that appeals to them. Now, if you move to the next stage of the buying process, which is, you know, they, they know they need the product, but how do they find, or they know they, they have this health need, how do they find information out? Doctors are a really critical component here. Um, I'm sorry these slides are not showing up perfectly, but doctors are, are a really critical component here no matter what. But you can see there's a big difference between the younger and the, and the older consumers. So 70, or almost 70% of, of older consumers say doctors are their primary source of information for health matters, whereas only 48% of younger consumers will, will identify that. Um, and, and by the way, the, the reason these numbers don't add up to 100% is because they're, you know, they're, they were allowed to choose multiple sources of information. Um, but, but younger consumers, as, as Dave said, are more likely to rely on the internet. Um, but another really important aspect are friends and family. So word of mouth referrals are really critical for where they go to find um, information about health products and health brands. Uh, and I think that, that, that's something that, that sometimes is lost on how we jump to the next level. 
But, but then you move to the next stage of the buying process where they're at the shelf and, and they're ready to make a purchase decision. And there are significant differences in, in generations here as well. Um, the doctor recommendation, 33% of, pe- of the older consumers will tell you that the doctor's recommendation about a brand or a product is the most important factor in, in what they choose, which product they choose. We hear a lot about sustainability. It hasn't reached a consumer level yet. Um, but you can see there are some differences between the generations. Um, only 2% of, of older consumers, though, say that sustainability is a factor in health purchases. Um, and so, you know, it is a big risk for our industry um, because, obviously, if we're not communicating and being proactive about managing our, our resources and where we're going to get our fish or where we're going to get other sources of omega-3s, um, then it can tear the whole industry down. Um, taste, which is another thing we hear all the time, actually doesn't play a huge role in, in the, the health decisions um, when they go to the shelf and choosing which product they might buy. But of course, that is another factor that's a risk factor because if they take the product and it doesn't taste good, then they could stop choosing your product and they may go to another competitor's product. Price is much more important for that younger generation, which makes sense because again, they're starting their lives out, they're starting their careers, they have lower disposable income. But, but again, the friends and family recommendation follows through not only as a source of information, but also as a factor in which product they choose um, and, and, and when, when they get to the shelf. And so, so there is, if you can build in loyalty programs or you can, you can um, try to foster um, product recommendations and um, word of mouth referrals, um, th- those are all um, valuable marketing activities. Now, there, we looked at all these other factors, too, um, like, like uh, quality perception, safety perceptions, brand recognition. And yes, they are important. A lot of them ranked higher than sustainability and taste perceptions. But between generations, there was absolutely no difference. Um, younger people feel the same uh, as older people in terms of how those things affect their purchases, purchasing behaviors. So if you sum, to sum this all up, if you put this into a buying process, and you have all these different ways consumers know they, they have this health need, um, either because they, they're trying to manage their heart health, they're trying to manage their brain health, um, and then you go to the next stage where you're doing the information gathering and where they turn, and then look lastly at, at the purchase decision, um, you can actually try to map uh, consumers' paths through this process and see where there's some dominant trends. And when we did that and we looked at the data, what we found is older consumers have one dominant path through the buying process. What they're trying to do is they're just starting up here, managing wellness, managing heart health, or managing brain health. So they have an acute thing they're worried about. They're they're trying, uh, as Dave put it, uh, managing quality of life. Um, They they start there, and then every one of them almost goes to the doctor and the pharmacist. In fact, 85% of these consumers said after they know they need a product, they go to the doctor and pharmacist to get more information. And then that doctor and pharmacist recommendation carries all the way through to to the shelf. If the doctor tells them, I'm going to buy brand X, then the consumer buys brand X. They don't really deviate. None of these other factors play a role. Younger consumers have a little bit more differentiation. They 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 aren't quite as dominant. Um, But but what's interesting is if, if you have a younger consumer that's focused on their family's well-being, they, word of mouth recommendations also follow through, uh, are, are also very important. Um, so if, you, if you're a young, new family, and you, you're worried about taking care of your kids, worried, want to make sure your spouse is healthy, um, a lot of times the community is important. So they'll talk about those issues with their friends, they'll talk about those issues with their family, um, and then you know, they'll, they'll get more information about what they're doing, and then when they go to the shelf to actually make a decision, that's where qual- these, this group actually depends on quality and safety perceptions. And it's not necessarily they're getting information from, from uh, the internet or other places about uh, what's a good quality product, but what they're actually doing is they're, they're actually forming their own opinions when they go to the shelf and they see this, you know, this, this massive array of uh, supplements or functional foods and it's all confusing. Um, but, but they do develop some sort of quality or safety perception, and they tend to buy the ones that they think is the highest quality because it links back to the need. They're going to take care of their family the best by buying the, the best quality product for their family. The other group of young consumers where you see a dominant trend are the people who are trying to maintain their energy or sleep better. Um, and stress plays into, into this as well somewhat. But what's interesting is these guys 
this, for, um, as younger consumers, this is the chronic disease management uh, for, for their generation. So older consumers are worried about managing heart health and managing their brain health. Um, the younger consumers treat managing energy, sleep, and stress the same way. And so they, if, they're, if they're worried about those issues, they go directly to the doctor. And then if the doctor tells them to take a product, they'll, they'll take that product. Or if their friend tells them to take a product, they'll take that product. And, and that's, that's kind of interesting because um, that's not a population that goes to the doctor as much, but yet they view energy and stress and sleep as a chronic condition, essentially. So, so just to summarize and a few key takeaways. I mean, for, for the older consumers, uh, educating the doctors really requires bringing new users um, into the market. Uh, or, or sorry, educating uh, doctors uh, will likely bring new users into the market, but also will help companies compete more effectively. And I haven't seen uh, that many effective campaigns for educating doctors in this industry. Um, and it's not a criticism. You know, we, when we talk as, as, um, as a nutrient uh, about educating doctors, what you're talking about is, is going up against a pharmaceutical industry. Um, and there are certainly pharmaceutical sources of omega-3s that are really important. And they're, they're spending a lot of money um, educating uh, doctors about their products. But, but from a nutrition perspective, there's also a lot of education that needs to happen. I mean, I, I've heard at numerous conferences uh, all these statistics about how doctors you know, get like two hours of nutrition training in medical school out of, out of the seven years that they have to go to school. Um, so, so that's a really important component if you're looking at a nutritional product. Again, pharmaceuticals are different. For younger omega-3 users with family, word of mouth and social campaigns are, are, um, may provide a good return on investment. And again, we're really at the beginning of understanding how you, how you can leverage the, all this new technology and these new tools. Um, maybe, maybe somebody will find a cool way to use their, their um, Android tablet to, to create some word of mouth referral. You may even leave it on the T or something, on a subway or something, and see if somebody picks up some omega-3 information. But, but I, I think um, Sam's going to talk about that, uh, and I think we, we can all learn a lot about how, how we leverage these things to, to get a health message and motivate this young generation. Um, Non-users of omega-3s who are, who are younger, they really need to be how, educated about how important omega-3s are to, to their, their career and life goals. Um, and I think one of the ways we have not been effective as an industry in communicating the benefits of omega threes is treating is is it telling them that this is an investment in their in their future basically it's the same you know they're making sacrifices for their career well it's the same thing you make a sacrifice and you're going to you're going to have some return in the future and of course the, you know you can split all this data up and, and there's all these different ways and, and niches you know if you want to target the consumers who are, who are only concerned about sustainability with a high value product you can do that there's a portion of the population that's really interested in doing that but you have to go out and do the research um, and and so again that's part of the reason why we're going to make the, this these surveys available that we did to everybody here because we think it's important to, to, to find those niches. Because, you know, again, y we don't think that everybody should be um, going out and trying to, to use social media to, to sell their products. They, there are ways and niches and consumers that that appeals to. Um, and and I, I think I mentioned the other day, you know, one of the things we, we found when we asked consumers about their social media usage is that Facebook, you know, outlets like Facebook and Twitter and and um, and some of the other social media networks. There's really no difference. Uh, you know, the the users and non-users of omega threes are using those tools at the same levels, but but there are new interesting tools like Pinterest and and other social media tools where you start to see these big differences. I think I mentioned the other day that that 26 in our survey, 26 percent of young omega three consumers are using Pinterest compared to 9% of non-omega-3 users in that same age group. So, so again, there are all these niches and ways to segment, the, um, segment consumers out, and, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do that if we continue to operate under the paradigm of we need to just throw out as many omega-3 products on the shelf as we can. So that's um, all I have to say. Uh, oh, actually, there, there's one other thing I, I, I wanna close with, is there's another step in the buying process that I didn't put on here which is what happens after the consumer buys the product. Um, we didn't gather any data on that, but, but there are, you know, like I said, if, if, you know, they say taste isn't an important factor in when, they, when they buy the product, but if, it, if they buy it and it tastes bad afterwards, 
then that's when you lose them. So, so there's also this feedback loop that's the, the last stage of the buying process that people need to manage as well. Um, so that's all I have to say.